if you bleed too much, you die. What a surprise, right? And of course, this was recognized. Early mankind knew that, of, of course. Uh, as soon as needles and tubes became available, physicians started to transfuse blood in the people to save their lives, right? If you were bleeding too much, if you had surgery, they would put blood in you. Initially, most of this blood was from sheep, right? So they would bring a sheep into the operating room and run the blood from the sheep into the, the person. Surprisingly, sometimes it helped. Sometimes it also killed the person. Uh, even when they brought other people in and they took blood out of people into the, the person, it would sometimes help and sometimes it would kill them. They didn't know why. Right? Uh, it wasn't until 1901 that a man by the name of Carl Landsteiner figured out that there are different types of blood and that if you are immune to the type of blood that they give you, you'll have an immune reaction, it may end up killing you. So um, Landsteiner figured out that there were different blood types. You've all heard of the ABO types, and, and so this is, is what Landsteiner figured out. He figured out that on your red blood cells, there are markers called antigens, and if you have the A antigen, he said you are type A, right? And so in my little table up there, I go A type blood has the A antigen. If you had a marker called the B antigen, right, then you were type B. If you had both A and B, he said, okay, that's AB blood, right? So my diagram here, this would be a person that has AB blood. But if you had a red blood cell that didn't have either of those markers, he said that will be type O, meaning the absence of the antigens. All right, so type O has neither of those. Now, in addition to finding these antigens, Landsteiner figured out that you have antibodies to the antigens that are different than your own. So a person that has type A will have B antibodies, right? B antibodies to the B antigens. Okay, close this up here. Have that physical science building ready to go in the fall, folks. Yeah. Uh, a, a B person then has A antibodies. An A B person can't have antibodies to either A or B, or they would attack their own blood, right? So they have neither. And an O person, because they don't have any of the antigens, has both A and B antibodies. Now we're going to get to the RH factor in a minute, right? We're not going to go there yet. If we look at the genetics of this, it turns out that an A person has either two dominant genes, A and A, or a dominant and recessive, A and O. A B person has BB or BO. They don't bathe regularly. <laughs> uh, an AB person has to have both A and B genes. And an O person has neither of those genes, right? So it has both the O genes, recessive genes. So going back to Punnett squares, and this was from the beginning of the lab course, but not everybody has lab. So if you look at this, if a woman had type AO, so she was heterozygous, had the dominant gene and recessive, and she married a man that had type B blood, but he also had the recessive gene, then their possible offspring would be an AB, a B, an A, and an O. So they could have all four possible children. When we type your blood, we're typing it today in, in lab, and we say that you're type A, we don't know if you're AA or AO. We just know that you're type A, same with B. If that same AO woman married a man who was type O, possible offspring, would be 50-50 A and O. So when this was discovered, 
they said, since these types are inherited, it was the first test that was available when they did paternity testing. Okay? Very, very first test. Um, when this was first discovered, there was a, an interesting trial going on. Okay, now the name, the uh, silent film comedian, Charlie Chaplin. Dang, my brain went on the fritz there for a second. Charlie Chaplin was involved in a paternity suit. Uh, the woman accused Charlie of fathering her child. Uh, I don't remember what uh, Charlie's type was, but let's say that, for instance, that it was this, that he was O and the woman was A. Uh, let's say that the child was B. So his attorneys came in and said there's no way that an O person, Charlie, could have fathered a B child from this A woman. The judge listened to it all and said, Charlie, pay the woman anyway. Right? Uh, so it's classic case, right, of technology getting out in front of society, right, so that society wasn't ready to have the, the data. Uh, anyway, kind of interesting. But he could have, but he could have, but she had... If he was O and uh -huh. she was A, oh, an and O was a man cannot father okay. a B child from a A woman. I got could, it, Could not have been his, his child. Okay, so... Um, Let's see who can give blood to whom, right? In terms of, of uh, transfusion. So certainly an A can give to A, B to B, A, B to A, B, O to O. But very commonly, folks, there is not available blood for the person that needs the blood, right? Ideally, you want to give them the same type. But very commonly, there are situations where you don't have enough of the, the type that they need. So they need to be able to get blood from somebody that's not your type. So if we try to give B blood to an A person, right? We're gonna put the B blood into that A person. Look, the, the A person has B antibodies. And those B antibodies will attack every red cell that you put in them and destroy them. And when they're destroyed, they agglutinate, they clump up, they cause abnormal clotting because they're clumping. They lice, they plug up the kidney, possible death. So you wouldn't want to do that. You can't give A to B or B to A. Now look at the AB person. They don't have any antibodies to A or B. So an A person could give, a B person could give, and an O person could give to an AB. So sometimes we call the AB person the universal recipient. The O person has no antigens, and so we can give O blood to A, B, to B, and to A, because they have no antigens. You might be looking at this and say, well, yeah, the, no antigens on the red cells of the O person, but you do have antibodies, A and B, yes, but in a unit of blood, there are only a small amount of antibodies, right? So the antibodies from the donor are not gonna cause the problem. It's the antigens from the donor. Because I'm type O, if you try to put A blood into me, my immune system is gonna react and continue to fight that A blood until every single cell is destroyed. On the other hand, if you put my O blood into the A person, they're getting a few antibodies from me. Yes, they're gonna destroy a few of their A cells, but it will be a tiny amount and then all my antibodies will be gone. Right, those are just, just proteins. So the universal donor then we would say is type O. Well, let's look at this other type, the RH type. So you've heard that you're not just type A, they told you that you were A positive or A negative. The positive or negative is related to whether or not you have another antigen on your red blood cell called the RH antigen. So Landsteiner continued to work on blood typing. He found that there were still problems that were occurring. And by 1940, he was able to identify another antigen found on red blood cells. Because he first found it on the rhesus monkey, he called it the RH antigen. Right? Or RH for rhesus. Right? 
So we found it on the, the rhesus red blood cell. So the, if we go back to our little model here, if you happen to be type AB, but you had this other marker, the RH, then you, we would say you are AB positive. If you didn't have it, we would say you're AB negative. So if we look at this chart now, there's the antigens. And so an RH positive person has the positive antigen. The RH negative person does not have the antigen because it means the absence. If we look at the antibodies, well, an RH positive person is not going to have antibodies to positive because they would destroy their own blood. And they can't have positive, uh, uh, antibodies to negative because negative means there's no antigen. Right? So they're not going to have antibodies to that. Let's look at the RH negative person. That's the absence of the antigen, but it says possible positive antibodies. So unlike the ABO types, if you are RH negative, you won't have RH positive antibodies unless you are exposed to positive antigens. Okay? Yes? Um, this kind of makes sense because um, the father of my baby is O negative. I'm pardon me, O positive. I'm O negative. And in the beginning, I had to have a Rogan shot. Right. So, so we'll, we're going there in just a second. We'll right. go to so it's like Rogan. making sense now because I was thinking, Good. oh, oh, it should be okay, but it's not. Right. So it's the positive and the, and the negative. So, uh, it doesn't take many RH positive cells to activate your immune system. Uh, many years ago, there was a, an interesting case where a young boy uh, needed a blood transfusion. He was type RH negative, but when they went to do a cross match, they found that he had positive antibodies, which could have only happened if he was exposed to RH positive antigens, right, to RH positive blood. He had never had a transfusion before. After taking a very careful history, they found that, you'll, have to, you'll know by how old the story is, by what I'm going to say next, <laughs> that he had become blood brothers with one of his friends. Mm -hmm. So when I was a child, it was no big deal about blood. And when you had a really good friend, you made a little cut in your hand. They made a cut in their hand. You speared them together, and you were blood brothers. Okay? So he had become blood brothers with one of his friends, and enough blood had got into his body to sensitize his body and cause him to have RH positive antibodies. Now, he's still RH negative, right? We haven't changed his antigens, but he's RH negative with RH positive antibodies. Okay. So, uh, the true universal donor must therefore be O negative. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? O negative meaning you've got red blood cells that don't have either the A or the B or the positive RH antigen. So they can give to anybody. And the true universal recipient would be AB positive because they can receive from either a negative person or a positive person. Gary? Yes. Um, if you were in a non-emergency situation though, even um, though you had some O negative blood on hand, you would still try and match the AAB thing because of the antibody right. thing? Right. So if they can give you the same type that you are, they will give you the same so type that better. you are. But very commonly, that's not the case. They don't have the blood, so they'll use uh, O negative blood. By the way, folks, if you have an O negative person, or any negative person, doesn't have to be O negative, let's say they're B negative, and you're on the battlefield and all you have are an emergency situation, all you have is O positive blood, but you have a B negative person, you can have your choice now, let the person bleed out and die, or give them a transfusion of O positive blood. You'll give them the transfusion of O positive blood knowing that you'll save their life, but forevermore they're going to have positive antibodies. So you can give a negative person positive blood once 
right? Because they don't have the antibodies right then. They're gonna build antibodies from the transfusion that you gave them, but you've saved their life. Worry about the antibodies later. Can, sorry, can you say that one more time? So if you're Rh negative, you can receive positive blood one time, right? In an extreme emergency. So the question was asked, what about erythroblastosis fetalicin? The term wasn't used there, but let's break that down. <laughs> Osis is a condition. A blast, we know, is a precursor to whatever comes before that. So a condition of having immature red blood cells, erythroblasts, where does it occur? In the fetus. There's another name for this. I don't care that you know the other name, but I'd feel bad if I didn't tell you. Sometimes people call it hemolytic disease of the newborn. So you have your choice, right? Uh, but really, you got to know both. Don't, don't, know, don't worry about the hemolytic disease, but I want you to know erythroblastosis fetalis. If you want to know the other one, that one's up to you, right? Hemolytic disease of the newborn. So this is going to occur in babies that are born to women that are type Rh negative. They're type Rh negative. Let's, let's look at the, the problem. So. Here is a negative woman, right? She's Rh negative, married to a positive man. They have a positive baby. Now, they could have had a negative baby. Uh, it turns out that I didn't look at the genes of, right? It was on my chart there, but to be Rh positive, that's a dominant trait. So you can be plus plus or plus minus. If you're negative, you're minus minus. Okay? But so this positive man could have he could be heterozygous, and so there's a chance that they could have a negative negative and have a negative baby. But let's assume that, they, that she gets pregnant and has a positive baby. Blood from the mother does not cross into the fetus, right? Contrary to maybe kind of popular belief, right? Blood does not cross in. Uh, so the baby's blood is not mixing with the mother's blood. The mother's blood's not mixing with the baby. When the baby is born and the placenta pulls away from the uterus, red blood cells from that positive baby get into the mother. Huh? Those red blood cells will now sensitize the mother and cause her to produce positive antibodies. Forevermore, she'll be Rh negative with positive antibodies. She decides to have another baby and so they're trying to show that the antibodies are here. She has another baby that happens to be Rh positive. Now blood from the mother can't get into the baby, but positive antibodies can cross the placenta and do. So they go into the baby and they begin to destroy the baby's red blood cells. That's what they're supposed to do, right? Attack the red blood cells. That baby's red blood cells are dying, and so that baby's going to be cranking out red blood cells as fast as they can, and so they're going to have lots of erythroblasts in their bloodstream, right? Immature red blood cells. Not only will they have lots of immature red blood cells, they will have very high bilirubin levels. Where does bilirubin come from? The liver. The liver. Breakdown of red blood cells causes bilirubin. Bilirubin can damage the nervous system. These babies are sometimes miscarried. They may be stillborn, or they may simply be born with really high bilirubin levels. Hence, though, the, the uh, destruction of the red cells, why they call it hemolytic disease of the newborn. Right. Now, we don't want this to happen, right? So. When I was a baby, a baby, a young kid, my grandmother always used to tell me, stitch in time saves nine. What the heck is she talking about? <laughs> right? uh, if you repair something early, you don't have to worry about something down the line. Right? So let's take care of this early on so that we don't have to worry about it. In 1968, I don't care that you know 1968, in 1968, they discovered, or, or, or not discovered, they first produced a drug called Rogam. Right, so this, they figured out this disease and they produced this drug that was called Rogan. It's on the PowerPoint. I'm going to go back to it for a minute. Okay, so this Rogan consists 
of Rh positive antibodies. Okay? It is Rh positive antibodies. So let's go back. She's pregnant, she has that positive baby. She gives birth, and that's when the problem occurred, right? The cells from the baby got into the mother. We can give the mother this drug Rogam within 72 hours of the time of birth. It consists of Rh positive antibodies. What will it do to the red blood cells? Any red blood cells that are Rh positive will be destroyed. And so instead of the mother becoming sensitized, we're going to seek out and destroy all those red cells that got into her by giving her the shot of Rogam, right? So that her body never knows that she was exposed to Rh positive antigens. We're going to fool her, right? Because we're going to destroy the red cells first before they sensitize her immune system. If you leave those red cells in for longer than 72 hours, they don't know exactly what the, the timeline is, but 72 hours was chosen because of the early research. But if you leave those red cells in, once her immune system finds those red cells, she will become sensitized and she'll always be sensitized. Right, so the key is to do this right away. Now, even though this occurs mostly when the baby's born, Sometimes there are minute tears that occur in the placenta, between the placenta and the uterus. And so to stop the mother from being sensitized during her pregnancy, it's pretty common practice to inject Rh negative mothers with Rogam at 28 weeks. And I don't care that you know the 28 weeks, but at 28 weeks is when the mother first starts to produce these antibodies. And so they'll inject her with Rogam then, so that if any red cells from the baby are getting into her, they'll be destroyed. Now, some of the Rogam will go into the baby, but minute. Yes? Um, so you were saying that blood doesn't, isn't shared between mother and baby. Is that in all cases? In all cases. Okay. So blood is not shared, right? It's, that's kind of a, a myth. That your baby's born and has its mother's blood in it. No, it doesn't. But the antibodies could cross. Okay. So the key is, right, recognition that the woman is negative, man is positive, and uh, Rogan. Um, I don't know what else I was going to tell you. Something else in there, but that's okay. Do you have to get it again? I'm sorry? Each pregnancy, right? Every pregnancy, they're going to have to be given the, the Rogan again to prevent this. Give these babies, as, even if the pregnancy doesn't go to term. Right, so a miscarriage, an abortion, the woman still needs to receive Rogan. Every doctor knows this, right? So in modern medicine, every doctor knows that the baby's uh, positive, mother's negative, you've got to get the woman Rogan. Yeah. How common is this? Common. How common is it? You know, I, I don't know the statistics, but uh, Rh negative only makes up about 15% of the population. So but there's some uh, there's stat, stat, statistics out there. I don't know who they are. But, uh, oh. All right. Uh, oh, uh, if the baby is born with erythroblastosis fetalis, there are a number of things that they can do, even if the baby's in utero, so still in the uterus. But in the uterus or when they're born, they can transfuse into them O negative blood. Now, O negative blood has no antigens on it, right? Either A or B are Rh. So you can transfuse the O negative blood into the baby so that the baby now has the ability to, tr to carry oxygen normally. Right, so you replace their, their red cells. You haven't changed the baby's blood type. Their genes are still whatever their genes are, but temporarily you've given them O negative blood. And again, this can be done in the uterus as well. So if the, they know that the child has erythroblastosis fetalis, yes? So technically, if you had a mother that was O negative, you could transfuse that blood to the baby that was been Well, but you wouldn't want to do that because she would, the only reason she'd have Right, the baby has erythroblastosis fetalis is because the mother has antibodies to her own baby. Right, so you better go get yeah. So you better not use her blood. You better go get some 
some other blood that doesn't have the antibodies. So when is the mother activated to the RH positive? Is um, it, it can be as early as 28 weeks in the pregnancy, although typically it happens at birth. But okay. they have found cases as early as 20, so that's why at 28 weeks they'll, they'll give them a, a little bit of a shot. And they're going to monitor the antibody levels, what they call tighter levels, throughout the pregnancy. And? What, well, what's the end of the story then? The baby gets transfused with the O negative blood, and immediately it can transport oxygen, but you know, it's now, not going to. The problem wasn't the baby's blood, the problem was the mother's antibodies had gotten into the baby. Antibodies are just proteins, they break down within six weeks. Aha, uh -huh, so this doesn't have to go on forever. No, it, no, it just, just gets it over the hump. Forever. The other thing that they can do is that uh, because the baby has high bilirubin levels, they can expose the baby to ultraviolet lights, and ultraviolet light helps to break down bilirubin. Uh, and so they sometimes call these bili lights, and uh, they'll break down the bilirubin in the baby because uh, it's the bilirubin that's doing damage, in addition to not being able to adequately carry oxygen. Okay. So let's talk about actual transfusions. Uh, if you go and you donate blood, uh, they're going to citrate the blood. They'll type your blood, and they can store it at temperatures close to freezing uh, for somewhere between 35 to 45 days. They can take your red blood cells, remove the plasma, and they add a few other chemicals, and they can actually freeze your red blood cells and keep the red blood cells for many years. Uh, and so sometimes patients choose to have this done if they want to be able to give themselves a transfusion. So let's say the doctor says you need some elective surgery, you could go and donate blood tomorrow, and a month from now, two months from now, right, you could go in and have the surgery, and you would have your own blood to donate back to yourself because they have frozen, let's say, we better say two months, because one month, right, is not long enough for you to replace. But say two months later, they could transfuse your own blood back into you. Uh, once they developed the technique for freezing blood, it became a problem also for abuse by athletes, uh, so-called blood doping. Uh, in the 1984 Olympics that were held in LA, uh, our professional bicyclists freely admitted that they had done blood doping because there were no rules against it. So they had gone in, gotten a, a, a uh, done a donation, and then right before their events, had their own blood transfused into themselves so that they could have a higher oxygen carrying capacity, right, transport more oxygen. Is this the same thing as the cord blood thing? Uh, not the, quite the same, so it's not the same as cord blood because in, when they do cord blood, they're taking the stem cells out of the, the umbilical cord of a newborn child freezing that, and then you can come back later and get those stem cells. Similar, but a little different. So this blood doping is no longer legal? In blood doping is no longer allowed, but people still do it, right? So it's, it's pretty common. The first step when they uh, test uh, people in endurance sports, long distance, bicycling, the first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna check your hematocrit. And if you have a hematocrit greater than 50%, they're going to start checking to see if you have been doing uh, erythropoietin or blood doping. Yes? Is the main risk of that just having high blood pressure? I mean, there's an ethical element, but... It increases blood pressure and increases risk of clotting uh, and possible stroke. Uh, only about 5% of us regularly donate blood for you blood suckers. <laughs> right? Uh, that's horrible. 5% of the population regularly donating blood. It's a really good feeling to go and donate blood, folks. You know you're helping other people, and we have no real blood substitutes. We'll, we'll look at that in, in just a minute. So it's truly the gift of life. Jenny? So I'm from France, and I was told that I can't donate blood because I lived there from the beginning of my life. Why is that? Yeah, and so, uh, people that have, have lived in Europe for any kind of extended time, they're concerned about what you would call mad cow disease. 
so when uh, the livestock uh, was was, uh, you know, I, I didn't get into prions that much, but uh, in England they were taking cattle and feeding them um, remnants from sheep and other cattle. So when they would slaughter a cow, slaughter a sheep, they would take every other part that wasn't edible and grind it up and feed it back to sheep and cattle. Uh, well, that included the nervous system, and so they ended up with mad cow disease in the, the cattle. And when people ate those prions, people were getting Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease or mad, mad cow disease. Um, and because they don't know, it takes so long for the prions to show up, it's 15, 20, 25 years sometimes, they don't want, and they don't have a good test for it, they don't want people to donate that, that lived in, in Europe. Um, if you've had a tattoo within the last year, they're not gonna want you to donate because there's risk of hepatitis and AIDS from tattoo needles. Um, there's a, right, you have to be a certain weight, 105 pounds, I've never had to worry about that. Uh, they want to know questions about your, your sexual activity, right? Um, you know, it, it's a really nice feeling though. If you donate blood, you go down here. I like to go down here to the CHOP uh, blood bank. Um, you won't have lines. You don't have to wait in line. They have really good carrot cake. Um, and, and. So, Blood substitutes. There really are no good blood substitutes. Uh, we can use normal saline as a volume expander, right? So the person's bleeding out, you got nothing else, you jam in normal saline just to expand the volume so the heart has something to pump. But certainly it's not going to have the ability to transport oxygen, carbon dioxide, right? So it's just a volume expander. Plasma also works as a volume expander, but it doesn't have the, the red cells. Uh, gosh, it's been a good 20, 25 years ago, the Japanese came up with an idea. They said, <clears throat> let's take hydrocarbons, we'll knock off the hydrogens and stick on fluoride, uh, where the hydrogens are, and they call these chemicals per fluorochemicals, and fluorine is really, really good at bonding oxygen. And so they're able to load this chemical up with lots and lots of available oxygen, you can transfuse it into the person and it delivers large amounts of oxygen to the person. Doesn't take care of the CO2 transport, which we'll get to when we do the respiratory system, but nevertheless, a, a pretty good uh, uh, pretty good substitute. Not a great, not right, it's not 100%, but pretty good substitute. Uh, the drug, you don't need to know it, it's called oxygen. It's been around for a long time. Uh, particularly good for uh, people that for religious reasons refuse blood transfusions, right? So there are some religions, they don't want blood transfusion. The person's bleeding out, you can give them perforal chemicals and, and keep them alive. Uh, you don't have time to watch movies in, when you're in this class, but sometime when the class is over, there's an old movie, pretty old, called The Abyss. Any of you remember this? The Abyss. So, it's so old, most of you don't remember. But, it, you know, it's not a bad movie. So in the movie, uh, they want to be able to dive to the deepest levels of the ocean. Well, if you're trying to dive in very, very deep water, the fact that your lungs are a space causes problems because the water will crush your lungs. Mm -hmm. But if you fill the lungs up with fluid, fluid is not compressible. So what they did is they had these people inhale perfluorochemicals, a fluid, so that they no longer had to worry about compression of the, the, the chest. Uh, when this chemical was first out, I watched a really interesting video. They took a rat and they submerged the rat into a jar of the perfluorochemicals. And of course, at first the rat held its breath uh, and then it started kind of coughing and struggling as it started to inhale the liquid. But eventually it inhaled the liquid and began to breathe the liquid. So the rat was just swimming around in the liquid, breathing the per chloral chemicals. Right? Because it delivers oxygen to the capillaries and supplies blood, or supplies blood with oxygen. Uh, it's been probably close to 10 years now that uh, cow's hemoglobin has uh, been used in South Africa 
for uh, transfusions. So you can't give hemoglobin to a person because, or to another animal, because the hemoglobin is able to cross uh, into the uh, uh, glomeruli and it plugs the glomeruli up in the kidneys. Um, but they were able to link hemoglobin together, okay, the calcium globin linked into bigger molecules so that it doesn't get into the uh, glomeruli. Uh, they can store this cow's hemoglobin at room temperature for up to two years. Uh, so it's ideal for places where you don't have adequate blood supplies for numerous reasons in Africa, right? One, you don't have refrigeration, delivery systems, but you also have to worry about AIDS. And so they've been able to use cow's hemoglobin uh, for transfusions. Uh, some transfusion reactions. Um, if you go and donate blood and then somebody needs your blood, they're going to take the blood and they're going to match the type, right? So if you have an A positive person, they're going to try to match it to your A positive blood if you're A positive. But they're also going to take small amounts of the blood and mix them together to see if there is a reaction, if there is agglutination. Big difference between clotting and agglutination, right? Clotting comes from clotting factors. Agglutination comes from the antibodies. So they're gonna check for agglutination. Uh, if they happen to give you the wrong blood, you'll have a body-wide response as the blood begins to agglutinate, lysing of the cells, body-wide allergic reaction, plugging up your kidneys, possible death. It turns out that sometimes when they take, let's say, an A-positive donor and they mix the blood with an A-positive recipient, that they get agglutination, even though both types of blood are the same. Say, how can that be? It turns out there are many other blood types other than A, B, O, and RH, types that you've never heard about. Huh? Things like Lewis type, and Duffy type, and K, and L, and M, right? There are all these other antigens that are out there that you've never heard of. They're just not very common. They become a real problem when the person has had multiple transfusions. So let's say that you're A positive, you need a, 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 a transfusion. They give you A positive blood, but unbeknownst to you, the person with the A positive blood has another antigen on their red cell. They have the Lewis antigen. It doesn't matter because you've never been exposed to a Lewis antigen before. You're fine, right? You, but you produce Lewis antibodies. Next time you need a transfusion, if they go back to the same person and they try to give you A positive Lewis blood, you'll have a reaction to their blood. The more transfusions you have, the greater the risk that you've been exposed to more antigens, but the greater number of antibodies you have. So if you hear of somebody in the hospital that needs a transfusion, this person has an incredibly rare type, we can't... It's because they have all these antibodies to all of these other antigens. Okay, so that's it for blood.